Cool. Mm -hmm. Again, I'm going to share roughly what we're going to speak about, and then we'll probably go in other directions. So <laughs> I don't know why you bother. We never do stick with the conversations that we start, but they're always more fun then. Because it makes me feel like we have a plan and a structure. It's it's just a fallacy. It's like, hey, we're coming in knowing what we're doing and then haven't actually got a plan. What well, you don't need a plan with people like us. No. Just be like, right, let's go. Let's talk. We just have so many things that we think and talk about. It's, it's, and few people can talk about this yeah, true. in the same way. So we true. just have a lot of fun. So the, the basic plan structure is uh, Twitter was fun for me this week. So I, I want to discuss some of the things that came up. Cool. Um, the, the main one that I wanted to discuss was Nick Miner. You know, I'm going to share my screen. Um, so you can see what tweet it is that I'm talking about. So for everyone else having a look, this is this was the retweet, uh, and it triggered uh, a lot of conversation. And I figured we'd we'd go on with the conversation. So essentially, Nick tweeted about a survey that he sent to his linking your thinking subscribers, and he found that like a few people read zero to one hours a week, one to three was yellow, ten plus was the pink down here. But essentially, like. 50% of people or over 50% of people read more than three hours a week, uh, a book. Right. And what I are just... they do? My, my, my instant reaction is, is what are they doing with that? <laughs> exactly. That, that was one of the comments down there. Like one, one of the threads was like, how do people find the time to do this? And one of the other threads was what do they actually do with it? Like, is it nonfiction? Is it fiction? Like, what sort of books is it? And what are they actually doing with the reading of the books? Um, now, I'm going to briefly explain what my tweet was, my retweet. I said, I don't read any books because, like, I don't. <laughs> uh, I listen to podcasts, watch videos, read blogs, articles. But most importantly, I talk to practitioners. Like, that's what I actually learn most of my thing. Like, I would class you as a practitioner and I speak with you about the topics that we've yeah. come across. Right. Uh, and then books are great, but I find them. I find many of them are that was meant to be better. I, I tweeted this while I was like, yeah, on the train. <laughs> yeah, so uh, many of them are better explained by the author in the conversation. And mm. I, I think uh, I'm going to stop sharing now. I think there's a lot to unpack here. I want to preface this conversation by saying when when I see Nick say, do you read more than average linking your thinking subscribers? And then how many hours a week do you read books? Reading a book to me is not reading a couple of pages and then going and reading articles and blogs and <laughs> listening to podcasts and stuff. But that to me isn't reading a book because it's just a couple of pages of a average size 500, 600 page book. Like to me, reading a book, Mark Manson uses 10%. Like you've got to read 10% of the book before you've read the book, which is normally about a chapter, right? Yeah. I I just don't do that. I, I don't I don't see the point or the benefit of it because most of the time, if they're writing a book, if the book's old, <laughs> they're going to bring up points that are either outdated or have been challenged or the research is more up to date with now, or they've made a point in a sentence, but that point is summarized. Like it's a yeah. sentence, it's summarized in a book. And I don't want the cliff note summary. I want what actually happened. Like, why why is that statement true you've put maybe one source depending on the type of book it is like you've you've made a claim from your experience and your research etc cetera, etc cetera, but i don't know what your argument for the claim is unless they've expressed it but the books that express their claims are textbooks mm. <laughs> you can't just read a textbook a week because like i say every point they've made is a claim where you where I would want to go and look at the research. That's why I have two textbooks. Well, I guess you could argue the uh, becoming a sports coach. It's not a textbook, but it is, it is a textbook. <laughs> yes. it's a, come on, come on! It, it is a textbook in all but name. It's to me, it's an academic book. Yeah, well, yeah, academic book. Yeah, it's it's yeah. an academic book. Like you could read it, but you have to be an academic in the field for it to not feel like a textbook. Yeah. Because uh, when you read it, you were like, damn, uh, I have loads of questions. I have loads of things to go and do. And to me, 
that reading of a book is is like I I wouldn't be able to read three hours of uh what book have I got down there yeah cognitive psychology I couldn't just read three hours of that book in a week and be like right I now know no 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 <laughs> I, I would read I, a I, I I started reading through that book. And just every single, because I, I have the PDF, I was reading it um, in Zotero and I was like, highlight this, think about this, all this, all this, all this, all this, all that. Let me have, let me have the references. And I'm like, no, I remember you saying, do not look up the references. You're, you're uh, summarizing, you're fucked if you do. <laughs> yeah. I still haven't finished that book because every time I go back and I have the notes and I've imported them into um, Obsidian. Um, and every time I look at them and I'm like, oh yeah. And I just sit there and I think mm -hmm. for a while. And that was one of the irritating, irritating points about what Nick was tweeting about, because after that tweet, he then goes on to say reading a book is not just reading and then ex like explains some of the elements like uh, you don't have to read a book linearly. You can pick up any chapter. I'm like, OK, fine. But what does that mean? You can just dip into a book, read a couple of pages from a random chapter, a couple of pages from another chapter. And that's count that that counts as reading a book. Like to me, that's not reading a book. That's that's just picking out small articles inside of the book, which is what I read. I read articles that are really specific. And books, most books, don't have that information because books are most of the time the popular books that people read <coughs> are marketed to an audience. Yeah, which means they either repeat themselves throughout the book, like they have the the first chapter, which is like the summary of the the philosophy, the ideology, whatever it is, and then the rest of the book. Apologies for the dog. Um. And then the rest of the book is them repeating the same point, just in different ways. And because references are scary to the general public, they don't source stuff. Or it's like one story that from history or some example person. And you're like, that's great, that's cool, but there's no, no meaty evidence there. <laughs> so you can just read a chapter and they go, I've read the book, because you get the general gist. And to find anything more, I guess you could you could argue the 80-20 rule. I'm not a big fan of it, but 80% of the value comes with just a, a brief summary. Yeah, I mean, I'm using the rule because it's a popular thing, but it's just this, there's so little explanation in so many of the books that I, I just, I'd, I'd much rather read two or three academic articles and dive in on whatever their ideas are where, where but I want a book to trigger me to think. And that's what Nick says. Nick says a book isn't for your thinking, it's for to get you thinking. And I'm like, that's not a book. That's a piece of content. Like a tweet can do that. Obviously it has done. <laughs> so I'm like, so why, why would I read a book if I can trigger thought through content online, which is one, free. Um, books, most books you can't just get for free. <clears throat> wow i have something stuck in my throat um yeah books you can't just get for free um and content's easy to consume like youtube's podcasts mm -hmm. they're just easy to consume yeah yeah there's also there's almost <laughs> a, a hierarchy of quality as well that's been kind of assumed in there like a book is a higher quality thing i'll just keep talking so you can cough um like a higher quality thing to consume is a book and then content is quote unquote lower quality or is lesser quality. And and some often just say a book is basically the best form of, you know, the best quality content. But really all it is is a summary of ideas, as you were saying. It's very often no more than just a summary of ideas that have been squished together to make it palatable, to make it tasty, to make it like it, it, it's the marketing of ideas versus actual like the nitty-gritty of ideas which is always something that like i think we're both working on some kind of an idea for a book and i think my big resistance to it is the fact that i have so many things and it's like i could put all those things in there but it will be a textbook it will, it will read like a textbook because there's so many ideas It'll be a textbook with ideas, if that makes sense, um, which is kind of the same thing. But So the thing that interests me is I don't think Nick is an author. I don't think he's written a book. Um, but when I look at the conversations of people that have written books, 
you so Seth Godin, example one, has written I don't know how many bestsellers, like 16, 17, something mm-hmm. like that. And he has said candidly multiple times, my book or books are just my blog posts put in together. Like that's all he does with his books. He puts a blog post that either did well or got him thinking, and he expands on that story in the book. So you get what he's thinking if you read the blog. (laughs) So I haven't read any of his books, but I've been reading his blog for about two and a bit years now. And I've been listening to his podcast for uh, about the same amount of time. So I don't need to read the books because he has expressed all of the ideas in all of his best-selling books in the podcast with expansions on new ideas. With a, like He's applied the uh, purple cow concept to AI uh, in a recent podcast episode. No, don't ask me what it was because I don't remember. Um, it was one that I listened to on the train. But I was like, if you read the book, you won't get that that narrative. You won't get that story because AI didn't exist when he wrote the book. And that's where people are missing out by reading the book only. You'd have to consume the content. But what do you get if you consume the podcast? Well, you get the content of the purple cow, an updated version of his philosophy about the purple cow and how it applies to real life situations right now. So Seth, a best-selling author, would (laughs) he doesn't say not to read, but he says to be a part of the conversation and be involved in the practice and the work is important. That That's basically what his whole philosophy is about. It's about being involved in practice, talking with people in, in the field, in the practice, in practitioners, obviously what I'm doing, but he's talking about doing the thing, not just theorizing about the thing. And when, when I look at other authors like Ryan Holiday, he says, once I've written the book, it's not the end of the book. I keep going I keep taking notes and that could turn into the next book. So I'm like, and and Nick says, don't you read hist- historical books and stuff? And I'm like, no, because the ideas have evolved. Like the only reason I would need to go back to see where the original idea was is if I'm looking at history, which that's not my field, I'm looking at something that I need the original source for, i.e. JJ Gimson's original like seminal paper on something but there's going to be loads of commentaries on that and loads of expansions on that because some of the philosophies he had back then, obviously a little bit sexist, uh, um, that there are issues. Yeah, there are issues with those things in history. So getting the overall notes, the general gist and the words, it's much easier instead of going through an old paper, but to get Cliff's notes of the old paper through the experts that are studying the thing now. That's That's my argument to it. So... Reading books, I don't think, helps as yeah. much as people make it out to help. It's it's also just it's this thing in the PKM space of like, how many books have you read? Who can read more books? <laughs> Let's read more books. <laughs> Look at me, I can read more books. I've and read a thousand I, books this week. I, I, I've read a thousand books this week. Look <laughs> at me. No, you haven't. Because if you really read a book, it shouldn't be done that quickly. And I'm a fast reader if you can read fast you're not i I just don't think you're actually getting anything from the book apart from a fun story i feel there needs to be something that makes you stop that makes you pause because if something doesn't make you stop or pause then why are you reading it because if you're reading it for the sake of yeah but so is D D. <laughs> <laughs> that's my argument. I was like, yeah, reading reading Shakespeare might be fun for you, Nick, but for me, that's not fun. I'd much rather be watching a video or playing sport or learning something exciting, like finding out an interesting philosophy or something to do with that dynamical systems theory. Like I was recently looking at the <laughs> this is gonna sound really nerdy. I was looking at the anatomy of the dynamical systems equation through maths. Yeah. Um I did that on my lunch break. Wow. It was great fun. Um that to me is fun and nick's like nah read shakespeare i'm like no (laughs) no Uh, and i think and i think it is if reading is fun for you then reading is fun for you that's fine there's nothing wrong with that but my assumption is that people read because they think it makes them look intellectual or it makes them seem that they're learning lots so that they can share random ass facts which 
but, but like, that's what I mean. But, they, like, but there is no, there is no living of those facts. It is pure and simple. Like, hey, here is an idea that somebody said. Let me quote the book, and they quote the book, but don't think about their lived experience. I think it was, oh, what's his name, Derek Sivers. Um, mm. he once said something about quotes, which I don't re- remember because I'm not going to quote him, which is great. I'm like, instead of quoting the book, quote yourself. And mm-hmm. that's the kind of yeah. overall philosophy of that. Give your own interpretation of the quote. Yeah. It's like, how do you interpret that? And and those interpretations are far more interesting. I mean, I find them more interesting because they make me think. That's exactly. why these conversations are more fascinating because I always go away thinking about things. Because that's the kind of fun part. Exactly. Exactly. And so I was... and you can't have a conversation with a book. Also true. <laughs> they, they they don't fight back most of the time uh, i was watching a video from mark manson also another successful author by the way uh and he he was talking about reading books right uh i i had to look it up because i couldn't remember what the title was how to read faster i think was the video that i was watching and basically he says don't <laughs> like, I, yeah i remember would... that one i think i have actually that's one of the videos i have seen yes yeah, it, it was, he's basically saying, don't try and read faster. It's BS. Don't try and read more. It's BS. Don't try and read all the books because most of them have a load of BS in them to fill out the pages. Like, take what you need, think about it and go. Get out, yeah. Yeah. Like, he, he said that um, he, I, I can't remember whether it was the beginning of... I have this sequence in my head. I think it's that video. I'm going to find it for the video that I'm actually going to make on this topic because that's what I'm doing with my channel, making exciting, opinionated videos. Uh, But he's saying like, last year I read 100 books. This year I've read like more. And then when he explained how he had read them, he's read 10% of the books. Um, But he hasn't actually like used them. He's looked Mm. at them and gone, okay, that's okay. Doesn't really give me anything. I'm leaving it. <laughs> he's he, in like in some cases he read a couple of pages and he just decided you know what no this is repeating the same stuff I already know I'm not going to bother. And that is an author reading non-fiction books about his field. He knows his field well enough that most of the books he's reading don't give him anything because he's at the forefront of the field. Yeah. And I'm not saying I'm at the forefront of my field, but I'm certainly not in the back end. I'm certainly not a beginner in ecological dynamics. The fact that I can even say ecological dynamics without having to think, wait, what were those words again? <laughs> like the amount of people. I'm, like, not, I'm not a beginner either. Ecological dynamics. <laughs> like the words in there, like, I can quite easily add like metastable attenuation, affordances, constraints. Like they just come off the tip of my tongue because I'm familiar with the terms, familiar with the words. It's so interesting. So as I've been diving more into it, <laughs> And obviously, as part of what I bifurcation. Oh, hello. Yes. yes. Um, <laughs> as we go in, as I've been kind of exploring more and more of, so two things I've been exploring: one is AI, and one is this whole delicious Ed. Ed. Been, been I've, I've named him. Ed. It's it's Ed. All right, he Ed. is Ed. I, I can see him in my head. He's a stick figure, Ed. Yeah, I right, Ed, and and it's really interesting because what I've tried to do. Tried. I say tried. And then I just sob at the AI because it's thick. Um <laughs> of like and seeing, okay, cool. Let's see if it's got any better. And the prompts help, but I told Bing off so many times, like, no, no, that is not ecological dynamics. Stop talking about the environment, you morons. Um But it is, that's the problem. It is ecological dynamics because ED is environment and organism, and organism isn't specified as human. Yeah, <laughs> and I'm just like, I'm like, okay, fine, skill acquisition. And it was very funny because I was like, let's see whether it can write me an email and see what that looks like because I'm exploring that as content creation and all that stuff for one of my products. And it's just like, I put in sports psychology as well, because adding that in there to try and help prompt it in that direction. And and you might as well have just like read it for it. That, yeah, it, I did. Um, and I just looked at it. I was like, oh no, 
it just changed the ecological environment to sports environment. And I'm just like, <laughs> no. That's, that is the limitation with AI. It doesn't understand what it's writing. And you need lots of people to have been speaking and writing about it for the AI to recognize, oh, this is a yeah. popular word that goes after this word. But there aren't that many people speaking about it yet. I think it'll take a few years before that really happens, to be honest, uh, especially with the way society slowly progresses. Um, yeah. But yeah, and, and this is this is my argument with the books with this could come off a kind of harsh um, and this might be a bit of a hot take. And I'm going to preface this with everyone and say, take this with a pinch of salt. But I would argue a lot of those people reading books aren't reading books to learn anything. And if they are reading books to learn things, they're not doing anything with it. And when I say they're not doing anything with it, they're not act actively adding it to a philosophy of practice, understanding it from an awareness of the evidence, the research, the basis of where it comes from. And I would argue many of them wouldn't be able to have a solid argument with the points that they have consumed from whatever books they are. Um, even if it is like a fiction book, they'll be able to tell you the story. But most stories have a perspective, an argument, a philosophy behind them uh, that relates to something in the real world. Because that's where stories are built from. They're built from human experiences. And if I was to have a discussion slash argument with any of those people about the books that they're reading, if they're reading 10 plus hours a week, I... I I don't feel their arguments would be as strong as if they were reading other things as well. That, that, that's just like my gut instinct. If you've read a book for three hours, say you've read like chapters one, well, say you started in the middle, you read chapter three, then five, then seven and nine of a book. And you're like, right, I, I now know loads of stuff because I've read three hours of a book. I can almost guarantee you they would not have a good solid argument for any of those chapters because they will have forgotten what's in the first four chapters, well, however many chapters I named, first three chapters because they've been focused on the next chapter. They they got ideas like, oh, that's an interesting thought. And then they carry on reading because they've read the book for three hours. Whereas what I would do is I'd read a couple of sentences, then go and read loads of articles about it. And then I become attuned to information and I've troubleshooted. I've thought about the thing. And that might take me three hours. So for me, my three hours have much more value than their three hours. Does that make sense? Yeah, I, I kind of agree as well. One of the things that I've realized recently is that I'm not reading anywhere near as much as I used to. Because when I read, I don't want to read because it's fun. I want to read because I want to learn something. And I'm interested in, like, like you were saying, it's not about reading because I can read. It's reading because I want to sit with the thoughts and have that time and it needs its own ugh, deep work um i need to be able to attune to it i need to be able to just sit with the book and think about what i'm reading make highlights do research think more deeply about the ideas bring it into my own philosophy of practice and have all of that time just to be with the book and with the information around the book I'm going to go full ED now. All right, come on, Ed. Let's go, Ed. <laughs> Ed Ed's, Ed's been put on the, uh, on the uh, uh, what's the word? Uh, stage. That's the word. Yeah. yeah, Ed's on stage. So when I think about the reading of the book, I'm trying to work out what the ideology is behind the reading of the book to learn. Mm -hmm. And it is, I read book, I process, I output, I know. Cognitive yeah. psychology. And I was like, okay, maybe that's a bit of a straw man argument. Maybe they are going back and reading it again. But what are they reading? The same words. And unless they've had a different perspective, i.e. they've moved away from that environment to another environment with a different context, they're just doing the same thing, which is blocked practice. And we know through skill acquisition that blocked practice is not good if you want to understand how to perform the skill in more than just that one situation. So you need to read multiple books in academia that's synthesis and critique so read multiple books multiple articles but inside there it, like inside the tweet it's just 
the one book. And if you're reading the book over and over, you're, you're not doing anything new, anything different. So repetition without repetition is what comes up in my head as practice. Like, okay, so I want to read, I'm going to read this book. I read this chapter. That's repetition. <laughs> If you read the same thing again, but you need repetition without repetition, i.e. a different perspective, a different view, a different idea, a different study or article on that thing. But how do you find that thing, i.e. that paragraph in another book? So you've got one paragraph of a five to 600 page book and you want an opinion of someone else, another author, and they've written 16 books. How do you find that paragraph in those, what's that, uh, 6,500 words? how in the uh, pages even how do you find that uh you don't <laughs> you go to a podcast or an article where they talk about that repetition without repetition and that then you gain expertise in that topic and that idea that is ed practically put um into learning yeah and and those fundamental changes in perspective to me is why i'm like people say I'm built different. My brain is built different. Ugh, stupid thing. Um, but it's because when I speak about something, I have expertise in what it is that I'm speaking about. Most of the time, because when I open my mouth, I've researched what it is that I'm talking about. If I don't know what I'm talking about, I'm not going to talk about it. Or I'm going to be curious and ask people tons and tons of questions because yeah. I don't know. Yeah. And it's because I've done repetition without repetition and I can apply most of these things in different ways because I can see the connections much easier because I've experienced the thing, whatever uh, piece of information it is. I've experienced it in lots of different environments rather than reading it over and over and over again in the same book or reading it and then putting it in my notes and then taking my own interpretations of the stuff I've already read. Like you need to bring other stuff in, which requires read around knowledge. Better yeah. ignorance research is there. <laughs> and you don't find out about these terms unless you're in the literature and let's be blunt here books are simplified deliberately simplified so people can read it they don't use jargon most of the time unless they're academic books or um textbooks yeah and i'm not i'm not saying i'm gonna <laughs> clarify i'm not saying regular books are bad because they're not they help the general population get in interested in these things but when you are interested in the thing the the beginner book, the basic book doesn't do anything. If anything, it frustrates you because you sit there and go, that's wrong, that's stupid, that's wrong, that's stupid. Just like the woman, that, the, the behavioral um, scientist that read Atomic, uh, Atomic Habit, she was like, that's oversimplified, that's wrong, that's not even true. So she wrote her own book. But people won't read that because it's overcomplicated. It's not, it's accurate. Yeah. <clears throat> so may maybe that is my argument for why I don't read books. Books, to, a lot of books to me, are too oversimplified maybe i don't know i don't read books because they frustrate me yeah makes sense <clears throat> i don't read books because i just don't have time to, to actually dedicate for me it is that i want the dedicated time to actually just dive into it and without that dedicated time it is a waste of my time to read it in my opinion like mm -hmm. it's, it's just pointless like if, oh sure yeah let's just go and spend an hour reading something for what purpose? I have a very limited amount of time in my day. It's 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 serendipity. Serendipity because you you read the stuff, you take the notes, you put them in your in your in your notes app, and then you have serendipity, and and you come up or the the sorry the app comes up with the links for you that you didn't think about beforehand. What yeah. app is that? Oh, it's, 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 it's these tools called um, Tools for Thought. And, and oh, do they do that, do they? Yeah, yeah, oh, it right, links okay, your thinking cool. for you. I, w I wish mine did that. What am I doing so wrong? Let me go buy a course about it. Maybe it's, I should it, get a Notion tablet. That'll make things it's, better. It's all about note making, you see. Oh, there. Okay. Yeah, yeah, yeah. You've got to make lots of everyone. notes. I love how we are, we are called the PKM podcast, and we are now shitting on every PKM right now. Is that again? Then again, it's gonna pull there. It's gonna, you know, you weren't attuned to your. Uh... <laughs> As I said, <laughs> but for we those call un ourselves the PKM podcast. Quick, quickly, for those unaware, I pulled out my headphones so I couldn't hear what you were saying. Carry on. Yeah. So, um, <laughs> call ourselves the PKM podcast. Yeah, and yet we shit on PKMs. <laughs> this this is one of those things, right? 
where I, again, I've got another video planned for this. Yay! Like all of these opinions that we're sharing in this podcast, I've already like planned to make videos of. It's just I need to record them. Um, I think PKM is a sub sub term underneath the BASB, and the BASB is a amalgamation of GTD and hypothesis of extended cognition. Right, mm. but the community cult um, has. <laughs> ah, <laughs> it's true. <laughs> it's it's changed the meaning of BASB to fit a simpler model. Like yeah. I have a BASB app that that doesn't exist. I have a second brain app that doesn't exist. And Tiago even and mentioned- even in Tiago's own course, it's not one app. It's never been one app. He's never said it was one app. Exactly. His apps change as things emerge in the environment that he's in. He was in Notion, he went to, he saw Obsidian. He's now in ClickUp. Like, things are changing and evolving and this kind of i mean i've been there i think we both have we've both mm-hmm. been there um of like this app thing it's just crazy like i have i now find myself doing way more and achieving way more achieving way more and getting more out of my day because i'm not in one single app all day because mm-hmm. i have that adaptability that flexibility that movement around different applications and different tools because i don't just rely on one which is where notion really fell apart i got a video coming out of that i bet <laughs> that one's gonna be a fun one i'm i'm expecting a 40 percent dislike ratio <laughs> Ooh, spicy and, and i think because of like, what I said. and i think it's interesting because obviously some of what i'm doing is going back into notion and to be clear my opinions on Notion isn't the fact that it's awful, because it isn't awful. Because it's not, because no app is bad. Well, well, it's most apps have value in some way. There is some value from any application. And I think often it, it's commonly seen that when people in this, when practitioners talk about the apps that they like and the apps that they don't, it's very much a, you hate this, you love that. I don't Versus. hate Notion. I think Notion has value, and I still have some small little snippets in Notion. I like using Notion to view data in different ways, in ways that is a little bit simpler than what I would need in Obsidian. But I don't need to use it for my day-to-day business. I don't have a use for it in my day-to-day business because I have a system a bunch of disparate parts that come together in the environment that I need it to be in, in the environment that I'm in to support me in a way that fits my brain. So are you using Notion for the AI stuff? No, I'm using ChatGPT for the AI stuff. So what are you using Notion for? Uh, Notion, I use it, like I was saying, for data. So a good example of this is I actually have Notion um <clears throat> connecting to my convert kit and um, my convert kit comes into notion and i can see all the data in different ways um when i want to which at the moment i haven't actually done but it is there for when i'm ready right yeah i never actually looked into getting convert kit linked with obsidian because <clears throat> the convert kit data is i like it. i just need the surface data and that's enough for me yeah i don't like the way that the data is presented that's purely my own thing i like seeing data in different ways and i probably could use our table to be fair it's just I'm familiar with Notion. Yeah. That's literally yeah, think, the only reason. I think the only reason I see Notion as a use, uh, this is kind of like a, a spoiler to the video I'm planning on doing, uh, <laughs> but I think the only use I have for Notion in my head is wiki, like group wiki stuff or sharing information with the public as like mm-hmm. a, a free web page. <laughs> because Yeah, and okay. yeah I, also, I also see Notion as a discovery tool. I see it as like this is a way for you to play in a much more open space to figure out the way that you work because that's how I think uh, that's how it's I an use. introductory tool. Yeah, it's it's very much an introductory tool to the more like the nature of actually working within your own constraints that you have that appear that emerge and it it makes it easier for things to emerge and then once you get to a certain point it 
I, I don't know about that. Um, I think because the, because there is such a not necessarily a trouble, but the onboarding of Notion, I would argue, is harder than Obsidian to start with. Um, yeah, if you want to use it properly. Yeah. And when um, I say properly, I mean databases, because yeah. I, you just can't use Notion without databases. And unless you're doing like, ugh, ugh, I, I don't want to say writing in Notion because it's just not. It's still because of the because of the blocks, it still feels clunky. It it just doesn't feel like a text editor. But, yeah, mm-hmm. yeah. Um, actually, when I was speaking with them, so meal I had yesterday with a couple of friends. Um, when I was speaking with them. And there we were talking about Logseek and Rome and other sort of like block based tools. And I was like, it just doesn't feel nice to write lots of stuff. And they agreed. They were like, no, no, it doesn't. That's why they don't use the tools anymore. Whereas Obsidian is like, you can use blocks because you can just hotkey up, down words, well, blocks, paragraphs, um, or you can triple click and drag and drop them up and down. Um, that's all doable. But in Notion, you th- it's not quite there. So it's, to me, it's a it's a great tool for sharing wiki information. <laughs> um, if people aren't savvy enough to use something like Obsidian, and the the reason I say that is because Notion you can easily get someone signed on in Notion and then them click into pages and go around it. Obsidian you'd need someone that knows Obsidian to be able to do that. Yeah. Like, it's easier to just drag things around in Notion as a block-based editor to make like a web page-esque thing. You don't really need to know that much about Notion. It's fairly intuitive. Obsidian writing is really intuitive and just working in the thing, easy. When you want to start doing some sharing stuff, well, now you're looking at, okay, what cloud service am I going to use? And if I do use collaborative sync, what settings do I need to have in the sync? So there's yeah. more questions for that. Um, but I still see Notion as an introductory tool because it is so popular and there are so many help tutorials out there. There are not that many big help tutorials out there. Uh, and to me, it's interesting when I think about Notion and I think about Obsidian. Notion has lots of big creators, like Ali was one. Obviously, he's moved to ClickUp with his uh, team because they just... I think I think their reasoning is like they've outgrown Notion. Um, but... I would argue just Notion wasn't great to start with. <laughs> For project and task management, it's just, it's a faff. Um, yeah, so Ali was a big Notion person. He pushed a lot of students that way. Thomas Frank is obviously one, Marie Paulin, August Bradley. Like There are big Notion creators, Red Gregory as well, you could argue. Whereas when you look at Obsidian, I gr- granted, it's a much smaller app. You've got Nicole, who does a lot of stuff with the RGB. Uh, RPG things like the Dungeon Dragons, essentially. Um, you got myself, Brian Jenks, sort of, um, Sergio, a little bit, and a lot of the other creators. They're not what I would class as Obsidian creators. They're like they'll do a couple of videos on Obsidian, then a couple of videos on Tana, then a video on uh, Logsy, then then one on Ample Note, and they're they're just a PKM person. They're not a an Obsidian person using the app through and through sort of thing. So I'm like. It's not necessarily who's the next Nick Milo, <laughs> but Nick was the, he is the the figurehead of Obsidian learning. Like it, it just the way he is. Um, like what is it? Six figure, seven figure business? Um, linking your thinking. But Nick's got one element of Obsidian. Nicole's got another element, uh, element of Obsidian, but I'm like, there are more than that. Where are the other people? Obviously, I can be one, but I'm like, I want more people. Like, where are the others in Obsidian? And I, they're not there at the moment. I think that's because it's a text editor. It just, it does the basics. It's not very interesting. No, that's what I mean. <clears throat> like, when you try and explain, uh, Capano tweeted recently, what, what would you explain your uh, Obsidian to, to your friends? I'm like, a notes app. <laughs> and then to me, research. <laughs> yeah. You did say, <laughs> yeah, I did, I did, I, I did like it. It made me giggle. Yeah, it's very true though. Yeah, it's like, like, it's, but how how do you make a notes app sound fun? Ali said to me, "How do you use Obsidian?" I was like, "As a notes app, like <laughs> I put my notes in it, I write in it. Like that, I'm not gonna manage my life in Obsidian. No, I mean, I manage if, my life in 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 Morgan." Yeah, exactly. 
<laughs> my 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 life is in Morgan. <laughs> if Morgan was yeah. to crash, I would seriously struggle. If Obsidian was to to crash, I'd be extremely pissed off. Um, but I wouldn't struggle. <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. And if Morgan crashed, I did have Google. Well, yeah, obviously Google was uh, as the backup. But, but still, yeah. you lose your Morgan tasks. Mm-hmm. Yeah, no. Let's not talk about that. Just don't like. No, no, no. <laughs> Morgan can stay. Morgan, not allowed. <laughs> You're not allowed to become. Well, they've got VC back in, so in theory, they should be okay. I so, so. Yeah. Well, that was that was a, a lovely, interesting conversation. I feel like we triggered lots of people. Yeah. <laughs> Probably. <laughs> Is there anything else you want to add on to the conversation? Anything else you got lingering? Any lingerings? I I do want to ask you a little bit about the book progress. Like what what your thoughts on it? Because obviously you've uh, sort of uh, weaned off the business because home life, you know. Um, is the book sort of like a, a thing in your head that you've got sort of ticking over in the background or something you'd like to do or? Yeah, so it is very much ticking over in the back of my head at the moment. Um, the business has slowed right down. I'm now kind of like just ooh, let's start playing in that again. Um, <clears throat> a lot of what I want to be doing is to do with that book, and I'm just bringing my business back up to the point where it's an actual business with actual revenue. Um, that sustains itself. Um, that's kind of my plan first. And then once I get back up to that point in a new way, because things have changed rapidly and I can't be doing what I used to do now. Um, and so I've had to, I'm tweaking things, moving things around. Um, and once that's up and running, then I can start thinking about like actually consciously moving forward with the book idea, but it is there just playing in the back of my head it is emerging slowly and every so often i just like oh that's a good idea oh that's a good idea let's put that down let's put that down um yeah so okay yeah yeah um i've got like so many things like i want to do everything at once yeah i mean that's my problem i'm exactly the same i want to no, do that's why i asked once. yeah i like i i have so many ideas so many ideas for products so many ideas to make things like I've got two kind of... This this is why you just build a course and then you just put all the things in that one place. (laughs) I wish I could. I think I would kill the business owners if I ever was to ever do that. Just become the go-to course for businesses. No. It's too much effort. Can you imagine trying to actually do that? I've done it. Oh, yeah, with Obsidian. Have you seen the the size of that thing? And I'm restructuring I it. I haven't. I I do. I just look in there like, oh, 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 yeah. I, I one of the there are two things that I'm playing with right now. Um, one of them is like GPT related because people are interested, and I want to bring an alternative view to the well, controversial. Uh, yeah, it's it's a very like punchy, controversial topic right now. I'm just like, hey, let's just bring let's just bring the people back in there and go, hey, this can actually be helpful if you know how to use it. So I'm gonna show you how to use it. And then you can decide whether you want it. And if you don't, go away. If you do, great. Because the people I talk to, and it's really good cool, when you're in the space, you see all of these big, massive AI creators like, I created this, you can earn 10 million pounds, you can earn this and do this and do that. I'm like, sure, I guess, if all of the bits are aligned to do that. And then you've got the common marketing. Yeah, right? yeah I'm reading a tweet that came out. Uh, yeah, carry carry on. I'm now very intrigued by the story. That was very distracting. Okay. Um, yeah. And so everyone is talking about it from a marketing perspective and just a marketing perspective of like, now you don't need to be a copywriter. Well, I disagree because you do, because you need to understand the structure yourself to be able to make sure that you need that a read around that I cannot wait because you look so pained by that tweet. 
I just don't see the point of it. <laughs> I can't wait for that one. Um, like you need to understand the concepts to be able to effectively use use them with ChatGPT because it's a predictive text engine. That's it is a glorified predictive text engine. So you need to know the little things to say, which is all I'm teaching in my course, course monthly thing where I actually give people a prompt instead of just throwing hundreds of prompts at people. People don't understand what they're doing with it, mm. which is quite frankly, in my opinion, useless. Yeah. It's I useless. Think, I think, I think that's a conversation prompts. that needs to be in a community somewhere though. Because having having a video or a course or whatever, like it needs to be an ongoing conversation, like practitioners. Yeah. And that's exactly that's exactly the my plan. I have I've right. just been redesigning the onboarding for it. Um we could talk about that after. It. All yeah, nerdy yeah. tech stuff. Yeah, I've got I've some been questions for you as I've well been... about website stuff. Sweet. I've been redesigning the onboarding uh for it because I want to make it a little bit more where people actually are gonna start with one of my prompts, which is probably the biggest one, the flashy, the shiny one, because that one is really, really good. I like that one. So they'll start with that prompt and then they'll be taken through a journey of like other prompts so that they slowly learn. So it starts with one mega prompt, which just dumps them with loads of flashy, pretty stuff because it is pretty and it is really cool. And then I'm slowly going to bring in other concepts and teach other things so that it is very much like, this is what the prompt is. This is how we use it. This is why we use it. This is how I'm using it. This is how other people are using it. This is how people aren't using it. And I want to have more of a conversational element to it because then it's it's actual AI practitioners talking about what we're doing as we are practicing our use of it. Because mm. otherwise it's just... It can certainly do a lot, but I think people are... Um, they're they're trying to make it too to make it do too much at the moment, mm. like for the text specific. When it comes to images and stuff, that's a whole other conversation. That's a whole yeah, other... I, and I think I think honestly, it's it's a case of like understanding its limitations, whilst also not just assuming it's unable to do it, it's unable to do anything, because it it can't do everything, but it can do some things. And once you know what it can do and what it can't do, then you can start really using it to support you mm -hmm. it is an assistant that is all it is it is something that can work alongside you but it still needs you it's part of your extended cognition well yes that is exactly the point it is part of your extended cognition it is part of that it's yeah. an aspect of your system not your entire system are you familiar with the other e's extended embedded no, shit's not one. Embodied. Yeah. <laughs> embedded, embodied. One more. Oh, I missed one. Yeah, one more. There's four. Oh, what is that last one? Extended, what? embedded, embodied. Eh. Uh, eh. Uh, Inactive. Inactive. Yeah, yeah, thank you. Yeah, the, the reason I ask is, um, like, where people choose to put themselves kind of matters um along that spectrum and i find it interesting that a lot of people don't even know that there's a a choice to be made especially in the bsb space which relates to the tweet that i just read um, i'm not going to show you the tweet because it will call out the person that obviously tweeted the thing uh, but they said a second brain is not about perfection it's about structure and then quoted something what out. what yeah. structure then... <laughs> what Exactly. Uh, that's why I was like, sorry, uh, what, what quote are you going to use to back this up? Uh, it's from Sun K. Aaron's and says, a good structured workflow puts you back in charge and increases your freedom to do the right thing at the right time. Now, I've not read the book. <gasps> Shock horror. Um, and I can look at that quote and go, BS. A good, <laughs> a good structured workflow puts you back in charge. No. When when did you ever lose being in charge? Yeah, it's your it's your structure, it's your workflow. <laughs> exactly. Uh, and then no, so, no, no, and... no 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 it's wrong. That's so. That it's, assumes it's not that wrong. They... It's just a different perspective. That's the wrong perspective. <laughs> it's a different perspective. Okay, fine. It's a different wrong incorrect <laughs> based on so many misconceptions and assumptions that 
just go it's a different perspective um, different perspective and okay. and increases your freedom to do the right thing at the right time that's no what... you can't th- it's not a binary yes it is it's not a binary yes it is it's either structured or not structured oh shut up <laughs> Can I say it now? I'm <laughs> no no this is the problem with the space with that, with that, that side of the argument, which is the majority that, of it, that is that is the that is that right there is why I don't uh, why I find that why why I find the space so different. Yes, it is but a the, different perspective. The thing is, but though, there is so many problems with that perspective. There are so many a... assumptions being made. I ain't finished. There are so many assumptions being made. There are so many things that people are saying. Uh, you are assuming that there is a right or a wrong, which is a binary, which is a problem, because there aren't really that many binaries. It is a matter of opinion and about the environment that you are in. Because what happens, say, for example, in my example, where literally I have gone from having an incredibly structured day where basically my entire life is run by run by me in other words i work when i choose to i have no other elements that come in and how come now because things have changed does that mean i'm disorganized does that mean that i'm not in charge of what i'm doing of course i'm in charge of what i'm doing still <clears throat> you're I am still in charge of what i'm doing it doesn't change that hasn't changed it is it's because so is this now wrong how i'm working now i'm finished i'm finished i'm still ranting and this is, of course, completely uncensored and not thinking about what anyone else would think. But, like, does that mean that what I'm doing now is wrong? Because that's the thing. Is it wrong? In comparison to a, if you're comparing it to my previous process, I am less productive, less organized, less this. I'm all the lesses. I am disorganized and I need to be sorted out. But when you actually look at what's happening, am I getting the things done that I need to get done? Am I adapting to the environment that I'm in? Yes. Am I part of that environment that I'm in? Because that is the reality. What I am, my environment is the reality that I am currently in. And that may, no, you wait. Um, you, 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 you can talk nice science in a minute. <laughs> I'll just sit with my hand up. It's fine. You sit there with your hand up. Uh, like the environment that I am in is where things are happening. If you're in a if you're in a bubble, often what is spoken about with these binaries is, is a binary is in a bubble. That you're just in this, you, you're not considering anything. You're just considering one tiny facet instead of the entire environment you're in. You are constraining your environment to a degree, which I feel personally is unhelpful because no very few people will be in the exact same situation as you are which is why it is so difficult to have these binaries because a binary it it, it narrows your your actual potential for doing anything this is right this is wrong how do you know what makes you say your well, this is right and what this is wrong and what happens when things change None of that is considered in a stupid tweet, which is basically just this, hey, I think this, it there's no there's no conversation to be had. It's just this is right, this is wrong. End. It's like, but but why? Why is this right? How do you define what is right? How do you define what is wrong? What happens when this is this happens? Oh, well, that's just something else. Well, then that needs to be included in the conversation. Instead of just these. Mm. I was not a very um, structured argument. Apologies. It was nonlinear. It was a nonlinear discussion. So, uh, you may yeah, begin. so my. My argument for his point, love it, is is that he doesn't actually understand what he's talking about in the tweet. <laughs> um, I thought what you were about to say, which tried to, because normally I'm the one that has the other yeah, opinions yeah. with the well, balanced view. You're like, he don't understand shit. <laughs> <laughs> but let me explain, right? Yeah. I think that's the majority of people that tweet this shit because. <laughs> When you actually speak to them, they argue very similar points to what we're arguing. And 
the way they have categorized it in their heads and the way they evidence it in their heads is using what is popularized, i.e. Son K. Aaron's tweet. A quote. So they have a perspective, they have a view, and you can ask them about certain things and they will agree with the majority of what we say. But because they haven't linked what ecological dynamics is and what environments, constraints, affordances mean, because they haven't either been exposed to that, don't know of that, or haven't created those connections yet, the best connection they can make is to what's popularized, which is cognitive psychology. So when you actually look at his tweet, it's not wrong. It's just extremely simplified mm. because he doesn't know any better. Yeah, and I think that's the same for the majority of other people that are speaking in the space. When you have an argument with them or you have a discussion with them, if you were to say to anyone in the PKM space, is there one way to work? They'll all say, oh, no, everyone's slightly different. But what they tweet about, what they talk about and what they mm. emphasize doesn't match that. It's called behavioral um, behavioral integrity. Most people don't have behavioral integrity because they don't fully grasp, they're not fully aware of what their philosophy is, what their values and morals are. So when they start spouting stuff, what they're saying doesn't match up with what they actually believe, but they don't see the disconnect. So they don't see an issue with it. And then they try and argue themselves into a hole because no, this thing is right. Cause this person, they believe this person because either they're popular, they've got a book on it. They've read the book on it. They paid money to consume content course, blah, blah, blah. You're like, forget all of that stuff. Actually look at what you believe, what you think of and the argument you're making is there harmony between them? If there isn't, which that's my job, I would be like, hey, there's a big obstacle here. How do you make this connection? There's a massive wall in the way, i.e. it makes no effing sense. Um, and that's where those arguments need to be made. So he's not wrong. No. But he's oversimplified a lot. And yeah. I just read another, I was scrolling down Twitter while you were talking. Um, Tiago tweeted... For everyone referencing, like Twitter is the the place to find interesting conversations. Like a book, reading a book, I'm finding more things to talk about, more things to explore. Reading, like reading Twitter over the last ten minutes. Yeah. <laughs> so Tiago said, when building a second brain, don't copy someone's complex system. Okay, no immediate objections. I'm curious to what he means by complex system, though. And then goes on to say, start with a simple system. What does a sim simple system mean? And only make it more complex when you need to. There's no one size fits all. So, but the... isn't that actually giving a one size fits all solution? Because, and unfortunately, because this is my jam, simplicity specialist, the idea around simple, they it, the immediate assumption is minimal. But that tweet just summarizes exactly what I've just said. When building a second brain, don't com copy someone's complex system. Okay, so no one size fits all. I get that. And then the, the bottom comment, no one size fits all. Okay, fine. But in the middle where he says, start with a simple system. Well, everyone starts with a complex system. You can't not because dynamics, yeah. the world, life, it's complex. So you'd need a simpler system to someone else, which means comparison. But you said there's no one size fits all. So why are you even making the comparison to start with? And only make it more complex when you need to. Why are you making a system more complex? That makes it harder to maintain because entropy, it takes more energy to uphold the system when it's more complex because there's more parts to organize which means you don't want to make systems complex, which goes against what he's saying. There's no one size fits all. I'm like, there's two comments in there that make sense that they list that they like are with each other, but the middle bit, I'm like, yeah, there's, they're fighting against each other. <laughs> yeah. And that's where, yes, people could argue, okay, it's Twitter. It's going to be surface. It's going to be shallow, blah, blah, blah. But still, you can. Why does this? You guy, can reframe guy. that. You can reframe that very simply to make sure all three um, sentences follow the same train of thought. You, you, yeah, and when when you when you see this, and then you see multiple people say this thing, you then start believing it because humans believe what's generally said more. Well, generally, yeah, <laughs> it's it's a human bias, and I'm like, 
and this is this is when I personally can't morally put out some of the content that I would otherwise do because I'm like I don't want to put this out because it risks oversimplifying what everything else is what everyone else is saying. Yes, I will oversimplify things anyway because you need to when you're communicating with people that don't that aren't at the same level of expertise as you are. But avoiding misconceptions is what I would try and do. And yeah. I guess as an example, start with a simple system. No, I wouldn't say that. And only make it more complex when you need to. Like if he's talking about when when I say simple in Obsidian, start simple, make it more complex. That's the amount of technical and tactical information inside of the tool. Yeah. Maybe that's what he's referring to. In which case, start with a simple workflow and make it compl complex afterwards. Putting the word system there means so many things. Yeah. Which can lead to misinterpretation and oversimplification of someone's like thoughts about it. Um, I don't know what the responses are, but to me, that's where you need to be more specific with the words that you use and more deliberate with the words you choose to use. It's one of the replies um, that someone's put is goals law. All complex systems that work evolve from simpler systems that worked. If you want to build a complex system that works, build a simpler system first and then improve it over time. Uh, and then, I, Go goals law and all the other laws and fallacies and the rest of it, I, I don't put much stock in any of them. I, I'm reading the same response. I don't put much stock in any of them because most of them are laws and things that have been found as most of the time a correlation in a specific field and often doesn't actually transfer well to other fields, especially other dynamic fields. And um, what we're talking about is the dynamic field. It it, it just yeah. is. There is. There is no like... There's no question. I cannot about that. find an argument. There is no question. It is a dynamic field because of our own complexities. We are a dynamic system in ourselves, let alone anything else. And it's just like, is it someone put notion? I know. Is that the one you're looking at? Yeah. Yeah. I, I know. built my Zettelkasten system note box in notion. Okay. And it's going and it's doing a wonders for me. Okay. Zettelkasten system doesn't exist. Zettelkasten is note box system. You have a note taking system. Stop using Zettelkasten wrong. <laughs> like, it's a philosophy of taking notes, and the Zettelkasten system is just note taking. Why do you need to add jargon words? Don't need to. Because it makes you feel smart. I've been there, I've done it. Oh, yeah, we've all done it, but I'm like, mm, stop it. And what what I don't understand, maybe this is me not understanding social media, is if I'm not fully, if I don't have a, a, a an argument for why I'm using the words that I have, I don't talk about it. Hmm. Like, I'm not going to tweet something that I, I don't know what's really going on. I I reckon if you were to ask the person, what does a Zettelkasten system look like? Or a better question, how does a Zettelkasten system look different from a traditional note taking system? I'm like 90% sure, again, pull that number out of my ass, but 90% sure he's going to say Atomic Notes or Smart Notes, one of the two. I'm like, okay, what does that mean? How do you use that? How does that help you do whatever it is that you're doing? And what are, what I'm going to guess, because this is most of the conversations that I have inside of PKM space, is they'll then go, oh yeah, I now have loads of Atomic Notes or loads of Evergreen Notes or loads of whatever notes. Okay, um, what do you use them for? Hmm. oh they don't i'm not writing a book i don't need to. i'm just learning okay you're learning what what are your notes on and then just pick a random topic do you have notes on the extended cognition hypothesis of extended cognition because if you don't then why are you talking about it oh i'm not talking about it yes you are zettelkasten zettelkasten is built on dynamical systems theory <laughs> and you have a second brain which is extended cognition so if you don't have any notes on them yet you're talking about them all the time what are you learning? What are you taking notes on? I recognize I'm being deliberately probing um, and triggering, but it's just, it's frustrating. Yeah. I'm like, yeah. <clears throat> and, I, and I think like when you go into, it is so difficult to like, 
when I when I have asked questions, often it's, oh, look at this person's methodology. I don't want this person. I think we've spoken about it in the last, in a previous episode. Like, I don't want another person's methodology. I don't. I, I can look that up for myself. I'm probably already have. I want yours because actually that's more interesting. Because if I want to learn a big YouTuber's methodology, I'll go do that. But I don't. I want to learn yours, the people who are actually doing the work. I'm, I'm interested in what you have because that's actually interesting. Like, what do you do? How do you do it? Why do you do it? I, I find it. I find it funny how many people, when you ask, "Oh, how do you do this? Or how do you do that?" They just follow what like the big creator that they happen to watch does. They're like, mm. do you know why they do it like that? <laughs> If if you're following someone like Thomas Frank's system inside of Notion, do you have a team like in Notion? If not, then why are you doing everything he's doing? Oh no, I I, I take this out and then I take this out, and so you're not actually doing what Thomas Frank does. You're doing what you do. <laughs> yeah, cool. Then tell me what that is because that's more interesting because that's what I want to know because exactly. that's actually what's more valuable. Just telling me that this person says this doesn't help with anything. Exactly. I mean, I. That, that's what the obsidian onboarding course is moving towards like i want to help everyone use the tool as best i can but then if they want to know how i work what i do my workflow so workflow management um and how i work but that stuff that's hard that's that's hard to explain it's i would class it as valuable and that's the sort of stuff that you're like i can't just give this out for free <laughs> There's a lot of time, effort, experience, and, and and value that's gone into that, and that is where business, like business, gets involved. You're like, you can you can learn most of this stuff anywhere on the internet, but you can't learn how I work anywhere on the internet, and that's the stuff you charge for. That's the leverage, and and that that's what I have in my head. Um, but I know a lot of people disagree with like the whole business thing, so um, myself included to start with. But the only reason yeah. I'm more comfortable in it now is because I have a better better justification in myself as to why I can sell the things that I do. Imposter syndrome was obviously a part of that. Yeah. Yeah. Maybe that's a conversation for another day. That'd be interesting. I like that conversation. Yeah. Conversation for another day. I think I got to, uh, go to airport at some point today. <laughs> Don't know cool. yet. Waiting for a message. So All right, let's stop the recording. Uh, and then um, we'll talk to you next week. Yeah. Bye. <laughs>